out this evening for our third installment of our speaker series on the history of transportation in Sheboygan County. Um, I'd like to thank H.C. Denison Company for their uh, generous sponsorship of our uh, programming here at the Historical Society. Um, they've been uh, very generous for our, uh, to our programming here for many, many years, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's good to always have good local support um, when we're sharing the stories that we share here. I know several of you have uh, been coming weekly and I've been mentioning our program coordinator, Chloe, and her pregnancy. Well, they did give birth. Uh, the evening of March 9th, they gave birth to a little boy, Samuel Peter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the rest of the staff here is already hard at work and making sure that little Samuel is a museum nerd like the rest of us. So. Uh, <laughs> um, he and mom and dad are all doing fine, uh, and uh, they're, they're hanging in there. We've yet to meet them, but uh, hopefully soon uh, they'll bring them, bring them out for a visit. Um, tonight, we are going to be learning a little bit about the inner urban, uh, car 26, for those of you who are familiar uh, with this uh, mode of transportation. Um, tonight we welcome Evan Richards. He's a volunteer with the East Troy Railroad Museum. Uh, he spent several years working at the University of Wisconsin Space Science and Engineering Center, uh, and he was part of a team who built an instrument for the Hubble Telescope. So we have some uh, we we have some uh, high-ranking people here with us tonight. <laughs> um, so let's please welcome Evan here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the invitation. It's always fun to talk about interurbans. And it sounds like Chloe's got a uh, motorman trainee candidate, so get them on the schedule. Uh, yeah, we can always use the help. I've not had much time to prepare this talk. It was scheduled um, for uh, March 17th, 2020. <laughs> So, uh, you'll please excuse, it's got some rough edges, haven't had time to go over it. Well, this year is kind of special for the East Troy Railroad Museum, 50 years of a railroad museum. Actually, thank you. Um, May 27th, the Friday before Memorial Day, that is exactly 50 years to the day when the first uh, museum operations started back in 1972. So, uh, actually, we've been around longer than the inner urbans were running <laughs> in commercial service in between Milwaukee and East Troy. Okay, that uh, that is the Russ Porter print of uh, what purported to be 26 in the print. Uh, that was used as a fundraiser during the restoration of 26. Um, there's a photograph that looks suspiciously like that print, but that's of 27. Uh, there were three cars that were ordered in, at, at the same time, 25, 26, and 27. So in uh, prep, preparing to come all the way to Sheboygan to tell you folks about Sheboygan inner urbans, I discovered uh, a little while ago that um, your gift shop has two books uh, published by the Sheboygan Historical Society on interurbans. So thank you for the opportunity to bring Coles to Newcastle. <laughs> I appreciate that. But um, these are divided on, uh, well, this one is about the line out to Elkhart Lake, the Sheboygan Light and Power. And this one is uh, about the line to Milwaukee, which was built by the Milwaukee Northern and then later absorbed into the Milwaukee Electric. And we'll talk more about that. So what is this thing about inner urbans? Well, <clears throat> as cities became larger, it uh, they, they grew beyond the point where uh, you could leave your home in the morning and walk to work. That's essentially, in a small town that works. 
uh, not so much in a big city. So what did you have available in the uh, early days when cities were getting of that size? Well, they started just having essentially stagecoaches on the street, horse-drawn New York City that started in 1827. Um, then they put rails in the street to give a better ride. It was still horse-drawn, and they called them streetcars, and that was 1830s. But there was a problem, several problems, with that mode of motive power. And notice <clears throat> you have a, a the way to power transportation here, horses and mules, went for a long time. Then it got to be problems for the environment. Is this sounding familiar with present <laughs> mode of transportation? Okay. Um, anyway, there was this horse epidemic, uh, epizoic aphthenae, the great epizoic, killed a lot of the horses all of a sudden. And that uh, motivated, or was kind of the last straw to get some other means of locomotion around town. The other one really was, um, well, there's this uh, byproduct, shall we say, <laughs> of horses and mules. It, it's about 10 to 20 pounds a day per animal. In Milwaukee in the 1800s, 1880s, that was like five tons of manure per day. Some of it ended up on the barn floor where they kept them overnight, and that was shoveled out in the backyard. They had a mountain of manure in the Milwaukee, uh, next to the Milwaukee barn. The rest of it was uh, when it rained, it would go into the rivers and make them interesting. A lot of interesting verbiage about what that smelled like and the health aspects. But there was a, a real need for some new technology. Well, along comes Roebling and his wire rope. And so we had cable car systems where you move this cable, steam engine powered central cable. We know about the ones in San Francisco. They're kind of famous. Actually, one of the biggest systems was in Chicago. Uh, and it wasn't until the 1880s that things came together Technology, Edison developing how to generate power and light bulbs, then Tesla figuring out that DC power was not much good for transmitting over any kind of distance. They wanted to build a hydro dam at Niagara Falls and power Buffalo. Well, that was too far for DC. You lose too much in the. Well, along comes Tesla. Not an easy guy to work with. He was. You know, extremely on the spectrum. And um, anyway, Westinghouse hired him to help him develop AC power. And it was kind of through the um, understanding of his wife, who kind of got this whole autism thing before people knew about autism. And he required a prime number of vegetables on his plate to eat it. <laughs> Well, Westinghouse wife said, dear George, I'll do it. He's going to be really good for you. And she was right. He invented enough stuff. Westinghouse was able to develop AC <coughs> power generation. He put on a bid, to, um, outbid Edison on the uh, World's Fair in Chicago and lit it. And so AC power... So all these technologies are coming at about the same time. Uh, Frank Sprague invented the traction motor, which was the thing that could make it go and you could control the speed. So all those came together, and then we had electric streetcars. Um, Sheboygan was a little behind the curve. We started uh, horse-drawn streetcars here in 1886, but it didn't take long before... They went electric here, too. So you had streetcars. Meanwhile, there was another technology going on. I don't think it's ever going to amount to anything. <laughs> this internal combustion engine, it was actually invented a little bit before the electric light and electric power and so on. And then Benz got the first gasoline-powered automobile, you know, using the engine in the automobile. 
1885. About the same time we were developing all this stuff. Man, things must have been going crazy in that in those days, right? The, all this technology. Uh, 1895, this Niagara plant went into operation, and they showed that um, they could light buffalo from it and the World's Fair and so on. 1908, the Model T. Now, a problem with the Model T was that uh, where do you uh, where do you operate it? So, getting between cities was a problem. We didn't have really good roads, so. The electric streetcar was sort of expanded to outside the city. That's an inner urban. A little bigger car, a little faster, a little nicer, a little more comfortable for longer distance. In the 1890s, the development was just crazy. It's, if you look at the industry of inner urbans and streetcars, that just exploded in development and then collapsed almost as fast. So a whole industry came and went um, very quickly. It got to be 18,000 miles of track for interurbans, 10,000 cars. The biggest company in Wisconsin was the Milwaukee Electric Railway and Light, which eventually bought the Milwaukee Northern, came here to Sheboygan. And there were about 200 route miles of track. You get all kinds of numbers on track, but I don't count the double track and the sidings and all that kind of stuff, the routes. About 200 miles. And that reached a peak in about 1908 after they um, finished the line to Burlington, Wisconsin, which was supposed to go to Lake Geneva, but never did. And then they had the uh, rapid transit line developed in the 30s, so that they, sort of the peak of the system and the best service was about 1931. And abandonment started in 1938. Last TM interurban <laughs> operated in Milwaukee in 1951, and the last interurban in Wisconsin was the North Shore Line, which uh, ended on January 20th, 1963, a day which will live in infamy. <laughs> um, here's my calculation on the how I got the route miles for the. the Milwaukee Electric, the Sheboygan line, 57 miles from here. To, and originally that was part of, that was independent. That was Milwaukee Northern. Um, they bought, TM bought it in the 20s. Um, Milwaukee to Watertown, about 50 miles. Milwaukee to East Troy, 36 miles. Milwaukee to Burlington, it's also 36, but just so we don't double count, the, the part from Milwaukee to St. Martin's was the same for both of these branches. They split, so there's only 21 additional miles for the Burlington line, and then the Milwaukee-Kenosha line, 35. So that all should add up to 199 miles, if I did my math right. But um, Here's a map that was put out in 1916. Uh, a guy published a interstate electric railway uh, guide. The uh, steam railroads were kind of hostile to interurbans. They were competition. They were upstarts. They, uh, so the official guide to the railways for a long time did not list them. You know, there was a thing going on between them. But this is kind of nice because it shows most of the interurban trackage in the Midwest just before World War I. And you can see up here the uh, line from Milwaukee to Sheboygan. It shows the Sheboygan to Elkhart Lake line, the uh, lines up to East Troy and Burlington, the Illinois terminal system down here. The main line was from Peoria to St. Louis, and um, lots of the interurbans around Chicago and Indiana. Here's the South Shore line, North Shore line. <laughs> So there were a lot of interurbans. That, uh, that was a rapidly expanding industry for a while. Well, back to the horse cars. This is what um, some editorial cartoonists thought the experience was like riding a horse-drawn streetcar. It wasn't a very pleasant experience, apparently. This is, what, uh, this is a cable car line in Chicago. Uh, this was on Chicago Day during the uh, 1893 World's Fair. And you can see 
I think you can see this center uh, slot for the cable. In Chicago, they had the short cars had the grip and what were the power, and then the um, trailers with no power behind it. Here's um, State and Adams cable cars. You can see the slot in the track. Cable cars had a lot of problems, and you'll see this in San Francisco if you kind of get really interested in the details. Um, a crossing like this, you have two cables crossing. Well, what do you do? One of the grips has to let go, and they got to keep that straight. And if they don't, eh, there's all kinds of problems. So um, anyway, but uh, this one is uh, obviously it's on the right-hand side. It's going this way. The, uh, grips up front there. And uh, they even, well, they had tunnels under the Chicago River because the cable doesn't work too good on those uh, bridges <laughs> that fall down. So they went under the river. And the last cable cars ran in 1907, just about the time the electric interurban line was getting to East Troy. And close to the time, well, 1908 was when they ordered those nice interurban cars, one of which we still have. So that must have been a booming, happening time. Anyway, Model T invented about the same time, 1908. Well, if you had a Model T, this is kind of what you encountered if you were out in the country taking a nice, pleasant drive and not too great a weather. So that's, that's why interurbans really took hold. They operated in all kinds of weather. Here's the contrast. There's the operating in a ribbon, and there's the road that uh, you might be taking. So rather than deal with this mud and get a farmer to pull you through all of that, if you wanted to go in town and shop, well, you could just uh, stand there in the shelter and wait for them to pick you up. No cinders, no smoke, clean ride, service usually every couple of hours. Well, around Milwaukee, the system was... Uh, centered around the public service building that was built oh in the, uh, sometime around early 1900s uh, the building still exists today it's it's worth a visit i'd like to get inside when they, they open up a lot of downtown buildings for you can walk through them and they give tours i like to do that last time i was inside a lot of these spaces was um, when i was a kid and actually rode these in urbans from uh, from here, that was a while back, but um, yeah, you can see a, a duplex leap here and a couple more lined up. So the interurban terminal was down on the bottom floor, offices, and oh my goodness, they uh, they're a very progressive company. They they were really trying to sell electricity. Well, what the heck would you use electricity for? You know, you had oil lamps and candles and uh, hand pumps and stuff like that, wood stove. Why would you need ice box maybe, you know, actual ice? Uh, so what do you need power for? So they had to educate the public. And I say that the, um, the inner urban brought a lot of features of modern life. If you think about history, where people were, I tell my passengers sometimes, <laughs> if they appear to be in the mood for it, that the inner urban brought all kinds of things, transportation, uh, communication. You could get newspapers and you could you know, get, buy stuff and have it shipped out in the same day. Um, it brought power, so they had street lights. And I say it also brought you the church supper. <laughs> okay? Now, how many in here have been to a church supper, a church thing that involves hot food, any time that has not involved a Nesco? <laughs> People from out of state don't understand it when I'm talking about this. That's right? You have to have a Nesco for a church supper. I think it must be in the Wisconsin Constitution. <laughs> Why is that? Well... The uh, company called National Enamel and Stamping Company, NESCO, invented this roaster thing. 
Nobody knew what it was. So when they started selling it in 1935, 5,500 units, then TME RNL said, well, let's, um, let's promote this a little bit. Let's invite the housewives in. We have this auditorium. And doesn't this look like somebody's teaching people how to use crock pots? But those are Nesco's, right? Nesco's. And you could hold a lot of people there. They gave the ladies uh, special fairs, and they could shop, and they could go to movies or whatever. And they had this promotion. And, and you could put this on your power bill, so you could spread the payments over a year. In 1936, 20,000, and they just went off from there. Ergo, the inner urban brought you the church supper. Okay, <laughs> rest my case. All right. So let's talk about Sheboygan inner urban. So we, we, there's two lines to talk about. The one, the Milwaukee. It was the Milwaukee Northern, uh, 57 miles in at, from here to Milwaukee, and at the best timing was um, just under an hour and 45 minutes, so 104 minutes to Milwaukee. If 43 has got thick fog and lots of traffic, would you make it from here to Milwaukee in 104 minutes, do you think? Have we progressed? <laughs> A little more leisurely on the line out to Elkhart Lake, 23 miles, 87 minutes, but you're going through all those towns and lots of stops and so on. Here's from the uh, sort of the Bible of the Milwaukee Electric Interurban System is a book called TM for the first two initial TMER and L. It was a Central Electric Rail Fans publication and lots of detail, including maps and stuff. Well, the the interurban depot that was built and uh, opened in 1925, Pennsylvania Avenue and 8th Street, right here. And the Milwaukee interurbans would leave from there, go south, go west, and then out in the country. The Sheboygan interurban would take off from there, go north to Michigan Avenue, then west, and then back down to uh, Erie, I think we're about here on this map, right about there. So across the street, across Erie Avenue is, well, that, they've got a bike path. That's probably the old right of way. Okay, so the Milwaukee Northern, uh, they started service here in 1908, about the time the other line bought the uh, Cincinnati interurban cars. Um, it came in on streetcar tracks that were owned by the Sheboygan Power and Light that owned the Interurban. And uh, when they started service, it was a little longer trip to Milwaukee. Uh, 155 minutes. About that same time, Milwaukee Electric had uh, made a plan and got a charter for a line up through Cedarburg, Plymouth, Chilton, so on, to Appleton, sort of coming just around the north end of Lake Winnebago to Appleton. The only part of that line that was completed, the rails put down, was between Plymouth and Elkhart Lake. And then the, like a lot of things kind of stopped. There was a big financial panic in 1907. Um, we didn't have the Federal Reserve System in 1907, so things got, uh, capital froze up, a lot of projects just stopped. That's why the Interurban Line stopped in East Troy. Who would want to go to East Troy and stop there? Um, Burlington instead of Lake Geneva and so on. So things froze up <clears throat> because there wasn't a Federal Reserve, and um, J.P. Morgan basically was our Federal Reserve and bailed things out. Um, and that's what really stimulated having a Federal Reserve later, was this panic. So, in um, 1913, this portion that was built was sold to the Sheboygan Interurban. And so they were able to uh, extend their line from Plymouth to Elkhart Lake. 
and the competition to the Milwaukee Northern uh, evaporated. And since uh, they gave up on building their own line, TM and ER decided, well, eventually, I'll just buy the Milwaukee Northern. Why not? So they bought all the stock, and they really upgraded things. They had more deluxe service, they had nicer cars, parlor car service, got the schedule down to 98 minutes for the fastest expresses, and they built a new station. That's the one on, it's in, um, what is the cross street? I forgot. Anyway, it's the, hmm? Yeah, oh, right. Victorian chocolate shop. <laughs> Today. Yeah. We're driving around a little bit uh, last fall, and I couldn't resist stopping in. And um, nice pictures on the wall about car 26, and knowing that car 26 used to go from there. I just couldn't help opening my mouth and saying, well, you know, yeah, that car 26, I drove it last week. I did, you know, I, I get to drive that car down at East Troy. And so, I'm trying to act like a celebrity, but <laughs> anyway, I didn't get any free chocolate. Yeah, but they really have good chocolate in Boston. It's really great. That's the same trip we stopped at Miesfeld's and got a bunch of good stuff. You guys got good stuff up here. Anyway, that line lasted until 1940. And it was cut back um, to Port Washington, so the service was stopped then. Um, this was, again, out of that TM book, kind of shows where the, this, uh, well, it's a green line originally, but it's this thick one. Shows where it went. Um, and it entered Milwaukee kind of on the little bit west of north side. Uh, this was um, one of the early cars in the Milwaukee Northern. And here's a uh, copy of part of the timetable that shows their route. And they were advertising the connections at Milwaukee that they had various services. Here's uh, the Cedarburg Depot uh, from an old picture and what... Uh, Google Maps or Street View shows today. That's a visitor center. Here's a depot at Cedar Grove. That one, kind of the same style. Schedule of local trains. They started, they would have uh, every two-hour service from Sheboygan to Milwaukee. These are local trains, made all the stops. And then they also had limited trains, which made... Fewer stops, that's why they called them limiteds. And that service was pretty frequent. So you could get from Sheboygan to Milwaukee anytime you wanted to go and almost anytime you wanted to get back. It got much better and faster. This is an ad from the after the TM buyout. They actually named a couple of trains, the Sheboygan Limited and the Lakeshore Limited, and they had nice fancy drumhead signs, fancy seats, and very nice, and not not a bad schedule. Yeah, yeah, big money in those days. And this is what the um, interurbans look like. Uh, big, handsome cars with the, um, with the drumhead. This is the Cedarburg station from an old photo in the Earth uh, Street View. And here's that station that, um, well, TM actually built that. It was their money. Uh, Biggs was in an expanse, expansive mood. It, um, the grand opening was March 7th, 1925, at 11 a.m. Big celebration. Uh, the first Milwaukee departure left at noon that day from the depot. So, I wonder if they had any chocolates for sale in there. <laughs> this is a map of what it looked like around the depot. Here's the station itself. This is, and they have since sort of expanded the building to cover the covered platform. This is where the cars came in, and there was a yard and express station and. 
so they could come in here and then loop around to leave or vice versa. Um, and they built some pretty substantial buildings. It, it looks pretty good still today. That's, that was the day I visited. It was kind of rainy that day. And I was pleased to see they had some nice pictures in there of car 26. And so they're mindful of the history. Here's a picture um, in 1939. This is not long before things ended. Um, there's a couple of trains there, obviously, to Milwaukee. One, I would imagine this is the local train, and I say that because it says local on it. <laughs> Likewise, this is the limited, a little bigger, fancier duplex. And these cars were typical of what was operating on the Sheboygan line at that time. And for not much longer from that point. Here's on South 8th Street on the other side of the bridge, one of those duplexes. Here's one of the single cars operating. And that's number 111. 1111, sometimes called the Four Aces. It's the cover of a 1929 timetable, and this shows the TM system, um, the home of car 26 these days is between McWanago and East Troy. That's the part that still exists as part of our museum. And you can see uh, the dotted line there. It, it, when this timetable was published, they had abandoned service, rail service beyond Plymouth. So it only shows the line out to Plymouth from Sheboygan. But they, <laughs> they didn't want to go to East Troy. They wanted to go to Beloit with this line. Panic stopped it. Uh, two things stopped the Burlington line from getting to um, Lake Geneva. One was the financial panic, and one was, another was the folks in Lake Geneva who were not at all enthused about having these folks from Wisconsin invading their territory. So, so. And then the uh, line to Racine and Kenosha and uh, to Sheboygan. Sheboygan, they had some ideas for a while to uh, go on up to Green Bay. The Watertown line, um, that was supposed to go to Madison. And uh, Madison turns out to be the largest city in the Midwest that never had interurban service. Quite a distinction. Um, anyway, um, in the 20s, when things were still running fairly well, they advertised, since they knew they weren't going to be building in urban lines much anymore, they did connect up with their um, bus subsidiary so that you could plan a trip from Milwaukee to Green Bay with a real quick turnaround here in uh, Sheboygan transferring to the bus. And this is a page from the timetable, uh, the Sheboygan line. It gives you an idea of the service, a lot of it, um, and pretty fast. So um, a lot of options to get to Milwaukee. And this is what happened when um, this is kind of the market, I don't know, the Dow as a function of time. This is the great, uh, they call it the crash in the fall of 1929. Well, you can see why optimism kind of held on for a while. Market value goes up, and it comes down a little bit. It's not till almost a year later that it's pretty clear that things are headed in a bad direction. So. 1930, 31, there was still some basis for optimism. A lot of the uh, Milwaukee Northern Line is a uh, bike trail now. And there is a monument uh, to Paramount Records. Uh, I didn't know this until I was kind of poking around looking at some interesting historical tidbits for, for tonight. Um, major player in, in blues music. They didn't, they, that market was um, politically 
by today's standard, very incorrect terminology as race records. That was actually what they called it in the business because they were marketing. Jazz was enough popular through the general uh, public so that there was a market, but blues was kind of an acquired taste for most people at that point, but a big thing for the people who in certain places like Chicago where they had performers. And there was uh, the Wisconsin Chair Company kind of got into the record business because they were making cabinets for Edison phonographs originally. And then they decided, hmm, maybe we can make some money making some records that these guys don't want to make. So they, I think they bought a label and changed the name. And they, there were artists in Chicago, but the chair company didn't think it would make any sense to build a recording studio in Chicago and have to pay the rent. Very expensive in Chicago. Why not build one up here in uh, Grafton. Grafton? Grafton, yeah. So it was called the New York Recording Studio, Grafton, Wisconsin. Okay, seriously. Yeah, well, it says New York Recording Laboratories Incorporated, Port Washington. That's what they did. And that lasted into the Depression until it got kind of um, unprofitable. Nobody had money to spend. But here's what, what they could do. They could record in Grafton because the artists could actually get there by inner urban from Chicago, North Shore to Milwaukee, up on the Milwaukee Northern, then the TM. And uh, I looked up the timetables. They could leave Chicago at 5.30 a.m., uh, get to Port Washington at 9 o'clock in the morning. They could leave at uh, quarter to 6 and be back home by uh, 11 o'clock at night. Now, this was necessary because there were certain laws that these communities had that said that certain kinds of folks with certain skin tone had to be out of town by sundown. Yeah, that's the law. Sun, sunset laws, they called them. So the inner urban was able to facilitate these performing artists to come up, do a full day's recording, go back home, no problem, no problem with the law, everything's fine. Now, typical wages um, I don't know what they were. They were pretty small. Uh, people, yeah, it was 75 cents a day was the typical earnings of a minority person in Chicago at that time. But to record for this company, it was $10 per side. And you could do four sides in a day easily. 40 bucks in a day, opposed to 75 cents. So a lot of these kids, they were younger. So yeah, mom, going up to Grafton for the day. Why? Because uh, I'm going to make like what you make in, you know, a month in one day. And they did. So that's that was one of the uh, heritages of the inner urban line. This shows when they went through the chair factory in Port Washington. There was a, Port Washington wanted them off the city streets, and so they had a route that kind of hugged the um, lake shore behind Fish Brothers Fish Shanty and came out through the opening in the chair factory. This was a fan trip uh, about a year before abandonment. So, um, that that's that routing through the chair factory started in 1930. So anyway, okay, switching over to the Sheboygan in urban. Horse car in eight, uh, 1886, and the uh, power company took it over in 94, 95 electric streetcars. So horse cars didn't last long. Um, by a few years later, they had service out to Sheboygan Falls. And um, 
In 1901, apparently there were some incidents in town, and the city required what they called fenders. I got a picture of that coming up. Um, but then the line was sold, it was improved. In 1908, they bought these three nice inner urbans from the Cincinnati Car Company, 25, 26, 27. And then in 1913, they added the Plymouth to Elkhart Lake. Now, this fender was designed, this shows, a, I believe, a San Francisco streetcar. But this company made these things called fenders. It's a people catcher. So if you're not paying attention and the car comes along the street, trips you over this big rubber thing into this basket, the basket kind of plops down and holds you. Now that's awkward and that's probably unpleasant, but the alternative would be the wheels run over you. So this is a better alternative. City required those, a lot of cities required them because a lot of people were getting on, under the wheels of cars. So uh, our car 26 has one of those on each end. In 1927, they gave up the Plymouth to Elkhart Lake part of it. And then in 1931, interurbans were going out of business all over the place. There were lines in Oshkosh owned by the same power company, and they came to uh, Sheboygan. And the uh, wooden cars from Cincinnati were pretty much parked, except for s certain occasions when they had high demand, which wasn't a lot in those days. And in 1938, the line was abandoned. This is uh, from the TM book, shows the, shows the route. Again, we're, uh, I would say we're right about here someplace. In Sheboygan Falls, there's a junction, and a branch goes down downtown Sheboygan Falls, and the rest of it goes out here. This is stop number two, and I gather that that's pretty close into town. It's further into town than we are here. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what it looked like. It was at the side of the road. Here's an early open car, and uh, it's shown on the Elkhart Lake line again here. And this is a car that, well, again, with that fender, it was required by Sheboygan out in the country and the same type of car in downtown Sheboygan. And here's some early cars at the junction between the Sheboygan Falls line and the line to Plymouth. Uh, you look at this house here, and this is the street view from Google. It, it's still there from, uh, well, that's a very early picture. Um, and that's looking northeast at the corner of Fond du Lac and Poplar Street. This is uh, one of 26's sisters, number 25, downtown. Here's a picture of 26 uh, being uh, hauled by 25. Those cars did not have multiple unit connections, but when they did something like this for extra capacity, one was a trailer. So they could hook them together and pull them. Here's a picture you see a lot. Um, apparently it snows up here once in a while. And you can see the fender on, on the car here pretty well. And here, out in the country. And this, this is a photo looking the other way to the southwest at that uh, junction, and you can see that house again, same house. So, the uh, people coming from um, Kohler and, and uh, Plymouth could get off here and go to Sheboygan Falls. Now, this is number 27. They modified that in the later days, and you can see a big baggage type door in the side of it, but they still had the fenders. And uh, you see the Kohler office building, which uh, looks pretty much the same as it does today. And the uh, timetable, there was a lot of service uh, every hour between Plymouth and Sheboygan. Uh, 
not so much out to Elkhart Lake, but um, and then there was even more service between Sheboygan and Sheboygan Falls, a lot of commuters. Um, this is one of those, uh, there were five cars that were built in uh, 20, 1923 for the Oshkosh line that came here when the Oshkosh line went out of business and displaced the Cincinnati cars. Uh, here's another picture of it in town. And this is a 1935 timetable. By that time, service was much reduced, but there still was service. And there really wasn't ever much competition on the steam railroads. The um, Northwestern had service to Sheboygan, but sometimes at rather inconvenient times. And Milwaukee Road had service to Plymouth. Here's a picture of uh, 26 when it was in service here in Sheboygan, black and white picture. Here's a picture of 26 in service at East Troy with a group of incredibly enthusiastic school kids on a school trip. That's actually one of my favorite things. You just can't get people more enthused to be riding a trolley and actually learning a little history because what beats getting out of school for the day not only that, you get to ride a train, and if the teacher is really nice, there's an ice cream parlor right across the street. Oh, man, Just, you can't get it any better than that. Um, we also use, use it for charters, special occasions for people. It's, uh, it is a beautiful car. It is beloved by the rail fans, as I keep telling them. Um, we don't use it a lot because it, it has a small seating capacity. It's about 44. And if we have bigger crowds than we do for the latter part of the summer and fall, unless we need an extra train, it's just not going to be able to handle the, the crowds. But it's a favorite of the rail fan groups. And when they come, we like to show them the railroad and give them opportunity for a run by where you let them off and back down the line a little bit and come blasting by with the horn and everything and they can take their movies. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and there's my grandson pretending to be a motorman in um, car 26. And here is one of my favorite groups. This, there's a teacher. In fourth grade, the uh, state standards require they teach local history, Wisconsin history. This teacher, my nomination for teacher of the year always, her subject is car 26 history. <laughs> These kids come, they are prepared. They have great questions. Man, is that a lot of fun. That is, it's always a great group. This is the teacher right here in the blue. And uh, this guy here, uh, in the blue shirt back there, that character. He was, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed him. He walked up to me. Uh, this is him again. He said, uh, Mr. Motorman, blowing the whistle is on my bucket list. <laughs> I said, you came to the right place. Give us the two toots to get us going when we leave. So, yeah, made his day. We, we just have way too much fun. But just uh, I, that picture kind of captures the colors and everything. Um, there's another group with their picnic. Yeah, yet another photo. This is one that we... It was kind of a nice picture on a nice day. We used that as the cover photo on our um, calendar one year. And we have a guidebook. This was taken shortly before um, this was the same night the car was struck by lightning. I was the motorman. It came out of nowhere. Um, we used that for the cover of our guidebook. Um, notice this. Not very nice stool and this chalk here in this picture, but uh, here's the cover of the guidebook. We can Photoshop that stuff out to make it look better. 
So, yeah, there was a rogue lightning strike, and fortunately we were at flat ground and the uh, fire department could get to us, and they were very careful to uh, not, you know, the fire chief says, yeah, leave the axes down here, boys. Uh, we don't, we don't want to chop it up. But um, th that was on July 23rd, 2016, at about 7.22 in the evening. Uh, yeah, that, that is a memorable night. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Uh, and the car, the lightning actually hit the uh, depot and came down the trolley wire almost a mile. There was enough energy to actually arc through. This is a light fixture. And there are uh, tie rods that hold the body to the frame. And it arced over to the tie rods set that on fire. Um, fortunately, we had a guy that uh, knew right away to get that pole down off the wire. Uh, 600 volts was still on and took the fire extinguisher, put the fire out, and we got everybody off. And uh, the insurance covered a very nice restoration, but it was, um, it was kind of a disheartening thing to see for a while. But they, they fixed it up really nice. Now, I had a gig bag back in that compartment where the lightning flashed in through the light fixture. Not a lot of people were back there, fortunately. And I, we had changed identification badges that year, and I used my old badge as kind of a name tag on my gig bag, and that's what it looked like after the incident. But um, a uh, few months out at Gomeco in Iowa, they made it look brand new and it's wonderful and it's still the star of some of the rail fan magazines there it is and uh, that's me by the way the motorman position on that shot that's in rail fan real road magazine march 19 or 2020 you know published about the time this talk was supposed to take place at the first time here's another rail fan group um I mean, this car just, it just looks great. We really enjoy it. Um, here it is in the fall next to our depot. Here it is passing the Milwaukee streetcar that we have. Yeah, we just, um, maybe that's about the place I should stop. Hey, what a great crew. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.